Good morning. My name is James Van Arsdale. I'm Vice President for Client Relations, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 CollegeNet User Conference, Innovation at the Boundaries of Benefit. We are pleased that approximately 500 of you have made the trip to Portland to join us for this week. Good things are ahead. As you do your work in scheduling, admissions, or any other college neck product or service area, you are working with technology that once emerged from an unsolved problem. This is the territory where college net innovates. The bigger the problem at the outset, the better. The more market skepticism, the better. In scheduling, for example, nobody thought faculty would ever let computers make decisions about, quote, their space. <laughs> but we knew that a new algorithm could save campuses millions in building and HVAC costs. In college admissions, people once worried how they would collect signatures or payments over the internet. But we knew that the emerging web had the potential to rid admissions of the paper applications, which, if laid end to end, could encircle the globe. Of course, none of these problems would have been solved without your involvement and feedback. You are the people who make automated scheduling, faculty and course evaluation, and admissions work. Many of you are also early adopters and creative thinkers. This is why we want you to understand how we approach innovation. Today, the latest unsolved problem CollegeNet has taken on, perhaps the biggest and most controversial, is how to turn the U.S. university system back into an engine for economic mobility. Here this morning to talk with us about this challenge is CollegeNet CEO Jim Wolfston. Thank you very much. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. And it's a privilege to speak to you because, as James said, all of these things that CollegeNet has done couldn't be done without you. No matter what CollegeNet innovates, if there's not users to make it work, it won't happen. We won't make a change in the world. So thank you so much for your ability. Many of you here are expert users of our products. Many of you want to be expert users. Many of you are cutting edge thinkers who are thinking ahead of the curve. And that's why it's very important for us to share with you, our special group, the thoughts that we have with respect to innovation. Now, have any of you seen this before? Any, any of you tuned into this, this station, WIIFM? Do you know about this? Anybody out there know about WIIFM? It's the most popular station in the world. It's been the most popular station for years. It stands for what is in it for me, OK? <laughs> now, this is actually a depiction not of a radio station, but this is a depiction of the vortex of innovation. The most important thing that our system encourages is an answer to the question, what's in it for me? What's in it for the investor? What's in it for the company? What's in it for the board of directors? That's usually the most compelling force in making a decision about where we're going to go with our money, with our ideas, with our technology. But we believe, CollegeNet believes, that's a mistake. That's a trap. Because quite often, the things that we invent, the what's in it for me isn't clear. It wasn't clear to us how we were going to make any money by doing automated classroom scheduling. But we knew we had an algorithm. We knew we had a way to help universities save money, to uh, use resources more efficiently. The same thing occurred with respect to admissions. Nobody at CollegeNet had an idea how we're going to turn this into money. Uh, people were asking us what, at the time we started. We started this before, uh, before Amazon, actually. And people were asking us, what's the difference between the web and the internet? We didn't even have an idea about WIIFM. But, Business requires this. Business generally requires that you frame some kind of business model, that you frame some kind of business case, that you work out the spreadsheet. You've got to solve this question first of what's in it for me. We think this is a trap. We think this is a mistake. And we're lucky to play outside of that boundary when we do innovative things because we can go directly to the question of what's beneficial to our customers, what's beneficial to society. That's where we can go at the outset, and we get a jump, we get an early start on some of these important problems. Now, a lot of this owes to Adam Smith. 240 years ago, Adam Smith wrote a very controversial statement that people have taken to mean that greed is good, right? He said he generally neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own security, only his own gain. 
And he is in this led by an invisible hand to promote an end to which, he, which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectively than he really intends to promote it, okay? So a lot of, frankly, a lot of greedy capitalists have taken this as, as the blessing to go ahead and go for it. Just go for it yourself, everything's gonna work out. Now the apologists for Adam Smith have said, no, 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 that's not right, he said frequently here. He said it is frequently the case that when we act in our own interest, everything does work out. It works out for the benefit of society. If I sell my car to you and we make a deal that it's worth 15,000 bucks, I get the cash, you get the car, everybody's happy. We've both acted in our self-interest. But we now know, thanks to big data, that this idea of Adam Smith is actually wrong in very, very important ways. After the recession, after the Great Recession, I don't know if any of you were around for back in the day when they were talking about the Japanese miracle. Well, the Japanese miracle cratered because the asset prices, the real estate in Tokyo collapsed. And so, so too did the economy. It was a speculative bubble, and most collapses, most recessions start with some kind of speculative bubble. But what really counts is what happens after that. Now, what this really brilliant economist named Richard Koo was able to determine from studying all the data, he was able to show that the Great Depression was owed to people following Adam Smith, acting in their own interest, acting virtuously, all right? Now, let me explain how this works. If you have a car that's worth 20,000 bucks, right? And you have equity in your home that's worth $100,000, but you also owe credit cards and student debt worth 50,000. Well, you're what's called solvent because you've got $120,000 worth of assets and you got $50,000 worth of liabilities. But what happens if the housing prices collapse and you lose your equity? Now all of a sudden you have $20,000 of equity in your automobile, zero in your, in your house, and you've got, still got that $50,000 debt. You're in a position of what's called insolvent. Now you might be able, if you still have your job, of course, to service your debt, but technically you're insolvent. Now that's a very bad place for businesses to be. And when asset prices crash like they did in the Great Recession or especially the Great Depression, when those asset prices crash, balance sheets get out of whack. And all of a sudden a whole bunch of businesses that weren't insolvent become insolvent. So the virtuous thing to do, the very reasonable thing to do, is for every business to pay down its debt. Duh! Then you can become solvent. Well, that's exactly the virtuous behavior that happened in the U.S. Great Depression. We understand that now, that private businesses were all acting, like Adam Smith said, in their own interest. But because all of the businesses were paying down debt, and the government was virtuous as well, Hoover's government said, no, we're not going to run any fiscal deficits, all that money was paid to debt, and it laid idle because nobody would borrow it. And so the GNP of the United States from 1929 to the depth of the Great Depression plummeted 50%. Unemployment was 50% in the urban areas. It truly was a Great Depression. But it was a Great Depression not so much because, like all bubbles, uh, it ended in some kind of recession. It was because of what happened afterwards. What happened afterwards was virtuous behavior. It's called the fallacy of composition. That if everybody does the right thing for themselves, it's going to end up a mess. It can end up a mess. Adam Smith is just wrong. It's proven now. He's wrong. But he's also wrong with respect to this idea of innovation. Definitely. CollegeNet has an advantage. CollegeNet has an advantage because we're able to work with you at the boundary of innovation. We're able to work and not worry about WIFM. What's in it for me? We're, willing, we're able to go outside of that and start worrying about right at the outset what's, what's good for you, what's good for society. There's no way that CollegeNet would have been involved in doing hospital payables if I hadn't met some really smart guys back about seven years ago who were saying, hey, you know what, there might be some way for us to actually extract from the payables that hospitals are, uh, are doling out some kind of revenue, some kind of automation. So we worked together to make that real. And today, one hospital, just one hospital client of InWorks gets $250,000 per year because of the innovations that we created. And InWorks has become a very, very valuable subsidiary. Again, because CollegeNet's able to invent outside the, the, the boundaries of benefit, in this, uh, not get sucked into this vortex. So we would actually rewrite Adam Smith 
If we knew what we knew today, we would rewrite Adam Smith to say the following. The wise company generally does not know how much it is promoting its self-interest. By focusing instead on solving the problems of society, the wise company frequently promotes the interest of itself far more effectively than if it had focused instead on its own returns. It is thus led by an invisible hand. If we had a chance to rewrite that, I think entrepreneurs in our world, in the Western world, would have been far more effective in solving the problems of society. Now, in, in keeping with that, what we've taken on recently is a very, very exciting and important problem that all of us have a stake in. It's now called Hawking's problem. And this is the problem of global inequality, particularly in the United States. Inequality in wealth and income. It's exploding in the United States. But Hawking was the first intellectual, the first brilliant person uh, who's widely known to link the, whether or not we can solve this problem with the fate of the human species. So this sounds like a worthy problem, doesn't it? If we could have a hand somehow in addressing this problem, not worry about the vortex of innovation, not worry about getting sucked into what's in it for me, but think about how we could actually address this problem as innovators. That's exactly what CollegeNet's doing. We have a tremendous opportunity at this time because whenever inequality redresses itself or corrects itself, it's typically through cataclysm or war, which is what I'm going to show you here. But we're in a special place in higher education. We have the thing that's necessary to distribute in order to create equality of opportunity in the United States and in our world. What did Hawking understand when he gave this uh, connection, when he, when he told us that if we don't solve this problem of inequality, it could be the fate of the species. He said, first of all, it's an issue of fairness. It's innate. He understood human nature. It's innate that we want to be just, we want to be fair. It has, it has a beautiful par paradoxical quality to it. We want to protect our children. We want to protect ourselves. We'll do so, however, fiercely. We'll go to war to, to redress injustices. That's the, that's the double edge of that beautiful human characteristic that all of us carry. Everybody here has a sense of what's just, what's fair for yourself, your children. Well, he also understood history. He also understood back in the 1500s that there was a scale of justice. And on the one side was absolute wealth inequality. It couldn't get any worse. Basically, you had the aristocrats of the church, and you had a whole bunch of peasants. But something countervailed that. The balance actually worked for hundreds of years because on the other side of this scale were the, were, were, were the pieties of the time, the belief that it really didn't matter much what happens now. What matters is what happens in our afterlife. And by the way, it's, it's harder for a rich man to go to heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. So we've got some advantages, peasants. It's actually okay. Further, we can go into these churches. There wasn't any internet. You, could, you couldn't look at the Palace of Versailles, the little hunting lodge that Louis XIV had. But you could go into the church. You could go into the church just like the popes and the kings. So this gave a sense of equanimity and justice in that society, even though wealth and income were terribly biased only to a small group of people. Well, that broke. That broke when the Catholic Church blew it. They introduced this concept of indulgences. They said, hey, look, if, if you're rich and you've taken your housekeeper as your mistress, you can restore yourself back in the eyes of God by paying some kind of emolument or fee to the church. Well, when the peasants found this out, they rebelled. 300,000 peasants of 300,000 peasants wielding their pitchforks and their axes, 100,000 were slaughtered and order was restored. But out of that in the 1500s, out of that German peasantry came Martin Luther. Martin Luther hammered his proclamations on the wall of the church. He basically did something heretical. He said, okay, uh, it's illegal by eternal damnation if you publish the Bible, if you publish the Bible in a language other than Latin. He went and did that. And the church, of course, under the competition of this new thread of Christianity, dismissed and, and uh, stopped this system of indulgences. So even though 100,000 people uh, died in that conflagration to reset that, that balance, um, the fact was change happened. 
So the peasants went back to the fields, and everything was fine for a couple hundred more years, except then the French Revolutionary Wars occurred. And that, Stephen Hawking understood, took more lives. This time, 1.7 million people were killed because the aristocrats had the audacity to impose taxes on the poor and middle classes. And think about back in that time, the United States was founded by a rebellion, a, a rebellion against the injustice of the king. Uh, no taxation without representation was the, was the rallying cry of America at uh, about this same time. And so, again, this time, it was a bloodbath. It wasn't 100,000 people, it was 1.7 million people. Run the clock forward now to the next set of injustices, the next imbalance with respect to wealth and income. You come to the Bell Epic right before World War I, and all this needed was some kind of trigger to light the tinder. The ass assassination of Archduke Ferdinand set off World War I, this time, not a million seven people killed, but 37 million people perished in World War I to reset that inequality. But the reset wasn't done very cleverly. It was, there were all kinds of reparations against Germany imposed, and as you can see in the slide, kids were making kites out of Deutschmarks, papering their walls, and so on. And in that was the fertile territory for the rise of uh, uh, a radical, a radical Adolf Hitler, who said we're going to make Germany great again, <laughs> to redress this injustice, this unfairness. And what happened, however, this time it wasn't 37 million people killed, it was over 100 million people died. And so Hawking's saying, look, the numbers keep going up, but now we have nuclear weapons, we've got to do something different, we've got to do something better. And that's the great opportunity that we have here. We have a great opportunity because unlike those earlier eras, we don't control the land and we can't redistribute the land. We don't control the, the industrial infrastructure in, in, prior to World War I. We can't dole that out. But we have the most important asset in the learning age. We have higher education. It's the most important thing that we control. If we can distribute this in a way that's reasonable, we can get a soft landing for economic uh, inequality that's happening now in the United States, and I'll explain this. First of all, a lot of people don't know this because we're still under the mythology that America is the, the land of opportunity. The United States among developed countries is the least economically mobile among all developed nations. That was a science uh, study that was done by MIT economist David Otter, published in uh, 2014. The U.S. levels of wealth and inequality are approaching the extremes of the Bell Epic before World War I. Right now, it's the case that three people, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates, the three of these gentlemen have more wealth than the bottom half of the U.S. population. And it's actually diverging as we speak. How long is that going to happen? I mean, at what point does, do, do we allow the United States of America to turn into uh, a society of a few aristocrats and, and the rest of the peasants? Now, what's also interesting with respect to, to income is that this is a Gini coefficient. This isn't a suggestion of redistribution. Uh, this is simply the facts with respect to how income is distributed in our country. And 40%, it would take 40%, that's what the Gini coefficient is, it would take 40% of the income that's doled out in the United States. You'd have to redistribute that for everybody to be quote unquote equal. Now, we know, <laughs> you're talking to a capitalist, we know that, that uh, Marx had it wrong. When Marx said, to, to each according to, to his needs, from each according to his ability, he had that wrong because he was missing the important ingredient of incentive. It's very important. One of the things that capitalist systems provide is an incentive. Think about it like this. There's a really wonderful book called The Triple Helix by Richard Lewontin, who's a Harvard biologist. The Triple Helix, the third strand, is the environment. It's not just the two DNA strands that you have. It's where you put your genetic potential. And he gave examples of shrubs. If you plant the seeds of a shrub, for example, at a thousand foot elevation, the shrub might flourish. But in fact, if you take that shrub and put it at 10,000 feet, it might not even germinate, okay? So it, it matters where the environment is, how the, how the environment is set up to, to produce to produce incentive in a society, it's very important that we have it set up as a meritocracy. I'm a great believer in that. And obviously, you're working for institutions that give out grades. 
Uh, and you give them out differential. Differential rewards are very, very important for societies to be successful. We know that. But economic divergence is a mistake. It's a big problem because it interferes with, with a sense that all of us have for human justice. Now, there's something very interesting. You saw on that chart, it wasn't just the United States that had the highest Gini coefficient among developed nations. It was also the U uh, UK. And one of the commentators before the Davos uh, 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 conference in Switzerland, the economic conference, was explaining that th he said, look, he says, I'm not saying what's right or wrong. I'm not saying what, what the best thing is to do. But the simple fact is you're going to see, and we're telling our investors, you're going to see more rises, rising through the world of, of, of populist movements. Uh, that's just a fact. And we can see that the Brexit vote in the UK was actually driven by the counties and boroughs outside of London, for, for which there really is no economic hope. The prosperity in Britain is primarily focused around the city of London and the, environment, and the, uh, the proximate environment. It's not the outlying boroughs. But the outlying boroughs are the ones that said, this is enough. The, the, uh, the, elites, the elites have led us to, to this. There's no hope for my future. There's no, I can't afford uh, education. Uh, there's too much uh, drugs. So of course, they voted against the idea of the uh, European Union. The same thing here in the United States. The studies show uh, whether you like Donald Trump or not, the fact is his base is the Rust Belt. His base is, is people who not necessarily are in dire uh, financial straits, but they're surrounded by people who don't have opportunity. They don't have sufficient opportunity, and they want to change the system. Totally understandable. But here's what, uh, what uh, Trump is doing. Trump is saying, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to blame it on the outsiders. We're going to blame it on the trading partners. We're going to blame it on China. We're going to blame it on the EU, because they, we're running a deficit against them. It's not fair. Well, it might not be fair, but it's also the fact that the United States now is the first country in the developed world, in the first time in our history, where the retiring generation is actually better educated than the incoming generation. So is it surprising that we might be missing something in terms of the global competition? The trade deficit last year was $566 billion. It's not a good thing, because basically what that amounts to is an, a, a disgorging of $566 billion in wealth from the United States to other nations. Because, of course, we get something back. We get something back in the terms of fuel or some automobile. But those depreciate quickly, but the cash remains. So it's tantamount to that kind of disgorging. Not a good thing. <clears throat> but look at this, what's quietly happening in the United States. First, look at the wealth distribution that exists here in this country. The top 10% of the wealth holders in this country own 75% of the nation's wealth. The bottom 90%, a supermajority, own 25%, okay? But what's happening every year is that this gap between the top 10% and the bottom 90% is growing, right? <clears throat> Here's what's happening. Last year, that gap grew by $3.4 trillion. Now think about it. If you have $100 and I have $100 and you give me $2, thank you very much, I appreciate it. I now have $102 and you have 98. That is an increase in the gap between us of $4. That's accounted for by a transfer of $2, right? So if the gap grew, as it did last year in 2017, if it grew by $3.4 trillion, that's equivalent to a transfer of wealth from the bottom 90% of our population to the top 10% of our population of $1.7 trillion. Where do you read about this in the press, okay? You don't read about this in the press because guess what? The, the press and the government are, are run by the top 10%. They're concerned, of course, about the trade deficit because their peers in, in Frankfurt, Germany, their peers in Shanghai are actually beating them. But they're the beneficiaries of this quiet wealth transfer that's happening every year in the United States of America. Now, people have a sense that something's going on, so something's wrong. There is this populist movement, but there's also a movement to believing in conspiracy theories. 52% of our population now believes in some conspiracy theory, that there was, there, there was reptiles that are running the government, that Bill Clinton's a clone. <laughs> There's all kinds of bizarre ideas out there to try to explain what the heck's going on. That the Illuminati figured this all out back in the 1950s, and by virtue of computers, they're controlling all of us. We're all a bunch of automatons here at their service. Well, actually, we've discovered in the past 10 years, thanks to the, thanks to the wonderful work of Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Satz at the University of California, Berkeley, that it's actually just arithmetic, okay? There's a relationship that if 
it's satisfied, will cause divergence to occur in capitalism. It's called R is greater than G. The rate of return on capital, typically worldwide, is about 5%. So if you average out the return on stocks, the return on real estates, and so on, over uh, the course of history, it's usually about 5%. When that's greater for a particular cohort, when that's greater than the growth of income for the population, the, the increase in income for the population plus the increase in the population itself, when that G is less than R, Divergence will occur unless there are attenuating circumstances, unless there's progressive taxation, unless there's investment in infrastructure, which everybody gets. We all benefit from the interstate highway. Uh, somebody's net wealth or net worth isn't determined uh, by looking at them on the, on the highway. You, you just can't tell. The internet itself is something that is widely distributed to all of us. Well, here's what's happened in history for capitalism. And that is that the only time that, that R was R greater than G was attenuated was in this period of essentially following World War II. From 1943 to 1980, it's considered by economists the golden age. That's when the middle class emerged. That's when America, at least economically, was great. Racially, forget it. There's all sorts of problems, as you'll see even today. We all know that, but you're going to see how higher education, unfortunately, is, is reinforcing uh, systemic racism by virtue of its preoccupation with getting students in who are from the richer classes, who are able to pay the tuition. But what was happening here was, was different. It was a special time. We are about to create a new planet that we will call Sputnik. The entire neighborhood, the entire city, in fact, the entire nation, it seemed, was standing outside watching what the Russians had done. We have to try at the root of the difficulty by educating the whole population of 170 million people. So this great equalizer, education, it was the nation's preoccupation to deliver it to everyone. Not only the University of California, which was saying, hey, look, these GIs defeated Hitler. We owe them a world-class education. The University of California system was, was founded on that idea. Not only the University of California, but the whole nation needed to deal with this threat. There was a counterpoise politically to the United States. We had a competitor, the, the Soviet Union. It was scary for people to watch Sputnik fly across the sky. And so the, the culture merged together to deliver education to everyone. That was the golden age. And then it changed because of the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed. No longer was there this threat. No longer was this throttle on pushing back on unions. People couldn't push back on unions during the Sputnik era. There's no way you could because there was danger that the, that the, that the union might flip the communism, might say, hey, look, these capitalists, this doesn't work. Uh, power for labor is not a, you had to be careful. It was the case that in progressive taxation that during the Eisenhower era, the top marginal tax rate was 90%, okay? And now, of course, it's, I don't know, 28%, 45%. But the Soviet Union collapsed. They collapsed because Marx was wrong. Marx was wrong about incentive. He was wrong about the idea of a meritocracy, that third strand of the DNA that's necessary to create invention, to create ambition, to create achievement. And the fact is, the educational legacy of Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, when he was governor of California, he, was, um, he didn't like those hippies that were protesting the Vietnam War. He excoriated them. Well, he became president, and the, uh, the whole game now was unbridled capitalism. Let's, let's ramp it up. Let's, let's give tax breaks to the millionaires. Let's, let's fire things up. And let's also cut education. Let's put education out where it belongs. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a business. It's a, it's a big sector of the U.S. economy. You guys go fend for yourself. You go figure it out. And so businesses became... Marketers, students became customers. The mission was to maintain the solvency of the institution. And the most important thing was to prepare yourself for the battle, the battle, the competition for prestige. Staged by US News and World Report. US News and World Report came out during this era. And all of a sudden, it became successful and essentially rescued the press empire of Mort Zuckerberg. And now he's a billionaire because US News and World Report rates everything. There's a lot of controversy, of course, around these ratings, as you'll see.
But what's happened in this process is that higher education has transformed into a counterweight for inequality because of the tuition bomb. Now you have to charge kids a whole bunch of tuition. People leave uh, your institution sometimes saddled with enormous debt. Uh, it's a 1.1 trillion ankle brace on the next generation. The admissions game, we're, we're involved in this. This is how we became aware of what is going on here. Uh, the standardized testing, we know from the research, is biased to the rich. We know that uh, SAT really stands for a student affluence test. Uh, it's just the way it is. It's the tightest correlation to SAT success, and why is that? Of course, because universities super score, and so a kid who takes the, the test 15 times, pick the best number, well, what kid can afford to do that? What kid can afford to pay the college board uh, 15 times whatever this test fee is? Only the rich. So in the United States right now, we have a perilous circumstance, and we can fix it. We can make a difference because we have the most important asset in this era. This is no longer the agrarian era. This is no longer the industrial era. This is no longer even the knowledge age. All the knowledge is out there on the internet. This is the learning age. Everybody, almost all of us, will actually go through 12 different job changes on average in your career. The people who can learn are the ones who can climb that ladder faster. So the product that we have in the learning age, things are changing so fast, is the product that your institutions are providing. If we can move this, if we can break the stranglehold of US News and World Report, if we can move this asset to underserved people, more than we're doing now by far, we can make a huge difference in terms of creating the first soft landing for economic and wealth inequality. Now, very interesting thing. People know, you know, your institution is virtuous. We're all good people. But in order to address this problem, a lot of people are saying, hey, look, I'm virtuous. It's OK, because I increased the number of Pell Grant recipients by 15% last year. No, they're not telling you, of course, in the press releases what small percentage, what small sliver that is of the total admitted population. But here's something else that's happening because of changes in the federal government, is that Pell Grants are being awarded more frequently to, to wealthier families. In fact, these are, the, these are what's called mathematically lower bounds. College has determined this from iPads. We know categorically in 2017 that at least, on average, 22.9% of the Pell Grants that were issued by higher education four-year institutions were to students whose families make more than $48,000. And that trend is continuing to go up. Now think about this. The Pell Grant is, system is very virtuous. If, if uh, we start a grant system here and we say, look, anybody here making less than $48,000 a year, call this the Jim Grant. I'm going to give you $1,000, okay? And that will actually level out to a certain degree. That will be a converging force on the relative incomes that we have in this room. Great system, because it's actually going to start lifting the underserved, uh, the disadvantaged a little bit. That's the whole concept of the Pell Grant system. But what happens if I say, hey, you know what, this is working pretty good. I'm going to just give 1000 bucks to everybody. Wow, that's great, isn't it? No, it actually completely rids the Pell system of its converging power. You see? So again, it's paradoxical that a virtue, seemingly, to give more Pell Grants to more people regardless of income is actually defeating the converging power of the Pell system. Now, another thing that's very interesting, how many people have read this book called The Blind Spot? Anybody here know about this book? It's really interesting if you actually read this, pick this book up. It has inside of it uh, something called the Implicit Association Test. And it's actually really embarrassing when you take this. Because I think of myself as a virtuous person. I think of myself as, I don't have any racial tendencies. Come on, I lo love black people. I got lots of black friends, play golf with people. I'm cool, we're equal opportunity in Florida. There's no way Jim Wilson's a racist. No way. Well, guess what? I have, like most, probably 99% of us, some racial tendencies that are implicit. And it's interesting because one of the persons who read this book is Malcolm Gladwell. He, he wrote The Tipping Point, famous author. He was on Oprah, and he was talking about taking this implicit association test, and he's biracial, and he said, my gosh, I didn't know I've got these implicit racial tendencies. It's really strange. But of course, we've all lived in a culture where white is associated with good. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. We've all heard that song. So again and again, if you tell a lie, it's a white lie if it's not a bad one, you see. So all these implicit associations have been established and grained. It's almost as though our reflective mind doesn't know what our automatic mind 
is telling us in terms of our behavior. This is true with respect to higher education. Higher education is the last place you'd expect any kind of racism to exist. But in fact, research is showing that people behave according to their automatic minds. When admissions offices go out of state to recruit students, do they go to the inner city schools? Do they go recruit uh, uh, students who, who have uh, p potential and capability? No, they go to the prep schools with whom they have relationships where, which are frankly, uh, most of the time, lily white. So this is a tacit, this is systemic racism, I'm sorry. It is because if you're selecting for rich, if you have to select for rich, you're implicitly selecting against blacks and Hispanics. That's a fact, because you look at this chart, the wealth of the Hispanics and blacks hovers here around zero, but for whites and Asians, it's substantially higher. The other problem that we have by being obeisant to U.S. News and World Report, by saying, okay, the best universities, the most prestigious universities are the universities that have large endowments. The best universities are the ones who, who have smaller classrooms, and for whatever reason, it's 19 is the cutoff. That means you have to construct a lot of buildings to uh, uh, jockey your ranking. The problem with this is that economic homogeneity dilutes critical thought. And I want to explain this. This is important. I see this a lot. People who come out of school have a lot of uh, presence and a lot of capability. They can dissect and pick out an argument and defeat it. Now, you see this a lot in Washington, Washington, D.C. My position's right, yours is wrong, and I can eviscerate your, your position. But you see very little of what I call advanced critical thinking. It's the ability to actually turn that question mark and skepticism at your own ideas. But that's where innovation, that's where revolution, that's where change can occur. And that's what's necessary on a university campus. Let me give you an example. <laughs> the people who figured out that the earth was not flat, when they figured that out, they weren't born that way. They became that way because they doubted what they inherited. They doubted what they believed. They started to see ships go over the horizon and thought, hmm, maybe this is not so, and speculated that the Earth, in fact, might be a sphere. Same thing for the uh, heliocentric universe. Copernicus uh, disagreed with the idea that the, it was geocentric. And you, you can prove, we can prove today, I mean, if we see the sun, it's a little cloudy out there now, but if we see the sun, we'll see it travel across the sky, for heaven's sakes. Well, these people who figured out that, no, it's us moving, not the sun, they had to disagree with their own idea. Galileo was almost killed for disagreeing with his own idea. His telescopes saw craters on the, on the moon, imperfections on the moon. That wasn't right because the idea then, the elements, there was no periodic table. There were f uh, four elements. There was, there was earth that was the most, and they were ordered. Earth was the most denigrated. Uh, water on top of that, air above that and fire because it leapt to the heavens. So the hierarchy was that whatever's in the center of the earth was essentially hell and damnation, but you go out to the firmament and you see seventh heaven through the little poles in the sky, okay? So <laughs> Galilee almost died because he looked through his telescope and saw that there were imperfections and they said, your telescope is wrong, all right? So here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to do. Whether College Net makes any money at this, who the heck knows? Who cares? There's so much at stake here. We need to change the way we think about prestige. We need to do what Galileo did. We need to change our conception that the best university is not necessarily the university that picks rich students who has the highest SAT score, who fills out the most admissions applications. Prestige because we're in danger of actually, we're academic institutions, we're in danger of actually reverting this beautiful word prestige to its roots. Its roots are illusion and trick, okay? Think about a card trick as a prestidigitation, right? It's your fingers and it's presta digitation. Digitation, presta. It's a trick, it's an illusion. It's an illusion when you say that an institution is better because it has a huge endowment. It's an illusion when you say an institution is better because it admits the students with higher SAT scores. It's an illusion to say an institution is better because it turns away more students. It calls a whole bunch of admissions applications and says, hey, my selectivity is 5%. That's an illusion. Prestige should go to the institutions that solve Hawking's problem, that address Hawking's problem. 
So I encourage you as the innovators, as the people who are closest to CollegeNet, who think with us, who are cutting edge people who want to do the best for the world and for society, for your universities, to look at our offering called the Social Mobility Index. Fortunately, we see Lyft, we see universities doing this conversation and reflection. And we see more and more universities paying attention to how effectively they enroll students from underserved populations, graduate them into good paying jobs. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>